Good afternoon. Thank you very much for your warm welcome. We live in an amazing universe. In it are extreme, energetic and exotic phenomena that can be challenging to explain with the laws of physics as we understand them. Studying and investigating the cosmos is enriching. It expands our horizons and it gives us perspective on our place in space. From the vantage point of this rocky planet, orbiting a rather ordinary star, which is itself in orbit through the disk of our galaxy, the Milky Way, our main source of information comes from light. Light in all its different colors and wavelengths is the means by which we can glean information about what's out there and how it is evolving. And so I chose light and what it is and how fast it relays information to us as the first concept to consider in this Gresham lecture series on cosmic concepts. So just over a month ago, I flew back from Australia back to here in the UK. That journey time took the best part of 24 hours because, of course, it's a long way to the other side of the planet. Australia is a long way away. 24 hours is, of course, quite a long time to be cooped up on a plane, even though I was flying on a modern aircraft at about 600 miles per hour. My journey time would have been vastly shorter if I could have traveled at the speed of light. <laughs> if I could have traveled at the speed of light, my journey time would have been about one fifteenth of a second. <laughs> Not even enough time to blink. Unfortunately, that wasn't possible. I was confined to an aircraft. So how do we begin to understand and evaluate how fast light travels? If all of the lights were to be switched on in this lecture hall, then the room would seemingly instantly fill with light. But does light travel infinitely quickly? Would the room truly be filling instantly? It's actually very hard to tell over such small distances as in this even relatively large lecture theatre. That's because when you're dealing with speeds that are at all fast, the time intervals that you need to make measurements over are very brief indeed. Let me remind you how we measure speed. We, consi we consider the distance travelled by something and we divide it by the time taken. And so it's particularly problematic when we're talking about very short distances for considerable speeds. The time of flight is of uh, necessity very, very short, meaning that very fast speed you want to measure is jolly hard to measure. Let's take a, a, a think about thunder and lightning. This may be fresh in the minds of many of the audience after the weather that we experienced in the UK yesterday. Many of us, I imagine, are familiar with the idea that we can see a fork of lightning significantly in advance of hearing the corresponding clap of thunder. If lightning is very far away, it was 20 kilometers away from the photographer in this picture, my colleague Steve Lee, you probably won't hear thunder at all. But let's consider what happens if lightning strikes rather closer. So just to pick a nearby pointy object, I'm going to go with St. Paul's Cathedral, which is just a couple of kilometers from here. Imagine that we're standing on the very top of this building, the Museum of London, and we see a fork of lightning strike the top. It would be over half a second before we would hear the corresponding clap of thunder. And that's because even though the distance to St. Paul's from the Museum of London is a couple of kilometers, 
if we're dealing with sound, then that's actually relatively easy to measure because we've got a longer time interval and the speed of sound is rather slower than the speed of light. If we are dealing with spe the speed of light and asking the question, how fast does that travel? We're dealing with much shorter time intervals because the speed, as I'll explain presently, is much, much faster. So two kilometers is way too small if you want to make a measurement of how fast the speed of light is. Just to help you calibrate and get a feel for the numbers, let me uh, tell you uh, what the speed of sound is. It's a little bit faster than that plane that I was flying on coming back from Australia. Speed of sound in typical conditions is something over 700 miles per hour. The speed of light, on the other hand, is something over 600 million miles per hour. So that should give you a feel for the ballpark ratio between the speed at which light travels and the rather more leisurely speed at which sound travels. It's a factor of a million. Just by way of a historical note, back in 1561, the then St. Paul's Cathedral was struck by lightning, and the ninth Gresham Professor of Astronomy, a century later, was responsible for the design of St. Paul's Cathedral that we see today. As far as architectural skills are concerned, I feel sure that as a Gresham Professor of Astronomy, I'm going to be something of a disappointment. <clears throat> but if our everyday experience is that the speed of light is rather fast, and indeed faster than anything. And I'm going to contend that the speed of light is finite. In other words, it is not infinitely fast. Light does not travel in an instant. How is it that we can go about measuring it? I've already indicated that making measurements over very short distances and two kilometers here is definitely very short indeed, if we measure over much larger distances, that measurement becomes a lot easier. So to accomplish such measurements, to go to much, much larger distances over which we want to make our measurements, we actually need to go out into the solar system, which while modest in size compared with, for example, the extent of our galaxy, it's plenty large enough to make a good measurement of the speed of light. Indeed, this was done over 340 years ago. The sort of distances that we're talking about are hundreds of thousands of kilometers. That already means that even though you're talking about the very rapid speed of light, the time intervals that you're talking about are much easier to measure. So, which components in the solar system were used to make the very first measurement of the speed of light 340 years ago? Let me introduce you to Galileo Galilei, who discovered something in orbit around the planet Jupiter. Here is an image of Jupiter and what is in orbit around Jupiter you may be able to discern four little dots of light. Those little dots of light actually are in orbit around Jupiter. They are satellites of Jupiter. Whereas our planet Earth has only one satellite, our moon, Jupiter has truckloads of moons. I think the number is about 79. I could be wrong, I haven't checked for a day or two. The number of moons in orbit around Jupiter is very, very large indeed, but these four are plenty bright enough that even with the relatively low-tech telescopes of a few centuries back, Galileo could visibly uh, see these and indeed watch them move around planet Jupiter. This particular image that I'm showing you here was observed last year at the uh, Global Jet Watch Telescope in India an observatory that I set up, as Sir Richard mentioned, um, to gather data for my research at the same time as doing my bit 
to encourage the next generation of young people in developing countries, especially girls, into science. Jupiter is a particularly favourite object to observe, as are the moons in orbit around it. So let me introduce you to these four brightest moons that are in orbit around Jupiter. The largest of these, seen here on the right, at the epoch at which this image was taken, because it's in orbit around Jupiter, so it'll be in a different place every time you look, Ganymede here is the outermost moon of these brightest four Galilean moons. Ganymede is larger than a small planet. Ganymede is larger in size than the planet Mercury. And it orbits Jupiter every week. It takes seven days for Ganymede to orbit around Jupiter. Let me introduce you to Callisto, seen on, Callisto, seen on the bottom left. Callisto orbits at a much more leisurely pace than Jupiter does. It takes 17 days to trace out a path around the planet Jupiter. It's also comparable in size with the planet Mercury, but it's much less dense. It's about one third of the mass of Mercury. Here is Europa. It's nipping around Jupiter rather more breezily with an orbital period of about three and a half days. It's the smallest of these four Galilean moons. But now I want to introduce you to Io. Io orbits Jupiter every 42 hours. That's about 1.7 days. So it is nipping around. And it is a favourite target of the uh, school children who operate some of the Global Jetwatch telescopes to watch as Io moves really very, very rapidly in orbit around Jupiter. Io is remarkable. Io is very volcanically active. Io has something like 400 active volcanoes. But my purpose in, in introducing you to Io today is because it played a very important role in the determination of the speed of light 340 odd years ago by the famous Danish scientist Ole Reumer. As Io traces out a circular path around Jupiter, it can be used as a cosmic clock. The periodicity of its motion gives something that can be timed relatively fairly precisely. I'll explain how in just a moment. Let me just show you a picture of um, Ole Reumer, a uh, very fine hairdo as you can see. All this work, let me emphasize, was carried out in 1676. Let me give you a bit of perspective on how he made the measurement. Like the rest of us, Ole Reumer was confined to this rocky planet Earth. Ignore for now the intervening planets of Mars and Mercury and Venus. And just think about our planet and Jupiter, which has orbiting around it 70-odd moons, but specifically the four that I've already mentioned. Ole Reumer made measurements of the time taken for Io to orbit around Jupiter. And he noticed that it wasn't the same duration of time whenever he measured it. There were systematic variations. Here is a figure taken from a publication shortly after he made those measurements and presented his results. What you have at the bottom, that large circle there, is designed to indicate Earth's orbit around the Sun. I should add that in modern days, we no longer think that the Sun has a smiley face on it. <clears throat> Up at the top of the image, we have um, the slightly larger circle there, traces out the path of the moon Io around Jupiter. And it gives the shaded region at the top is where Io is in shadow. 
even though it's being illuminated by the sun at the bottom of the plot, when Io passes behind Jupiter, it's in shadow and it can't be seen from Earth. But the moment that Io goes into shadow or comes out of shadow, that's a precise point that you can use to make a time stamp and thereby measure how long does it take for Io to orbit around Earth. Once you've got a cosmic clock and it's a long distance away, you can start thinking about the light travel time. How long does it take the light to leave Io and be received at a telescope here on planet Earth? You'll get a sense that it's going to depend on whether you're at point K or point L or point G or point F. And this is what Ola Roima measured over three centuries ago. Let me give you a modern day representation of this. So obviously it's in color. What I'm going to do for this, uh, what I've done in this simulation is to slow right down the speed of light because um, it would be a bit too rapid if uh, that were not the case. We've got Jupiter over on the left and that complete circle there is actually Io, currently in shadow because it's behind Jupiter. It's the far side of Jupiter from the sun, which is shining in from the right-hand side over here. So I'm going to switch on the movie now, but just watch as that circle orbits around Jupiter. <clears throat> so it's orbiting around Jupiter, and we can see it very clearly on Earth when it is not in shadow. Now just look for the moment at the blue circle that's moving across um, the uh, top of the screen. That's designed to represent planet Earth when it's moving towards Jupiter. I've done it in straight lines, which is taking a bit of a liberty um, just to schematically indicate what's going on. As Earth moves towards Jupiter, it encounters all the... Think of us getting a particular signal every time Io, for example, comes out of shadow now. Um, we actually encounter such pulses, four such pulses, in the schematic that I've shown you. But when Earth is moving away from Jupiter at different times of the year, indicated by this green circle, Earth is moving away and it's only intercepting three such pulses. You can think of this as a form of the Doppler effect if that's meaningful to you. But if that isn't um, a phrase that you know, worry not. Just consider that the time taken for light to travel can either be thought of as depending on the distance that you have to travel, and that depends on where Earth is in its orbit around the Sun, and that can be turned into the fact that the Earth is zooming towards Jupiter at certain times of the year and zooming away from Jupiter at other times of the year. By analysing these relatively simply measured data, Ola Roima was able to make a measurement of the value of the speed of light, the speed at which the signal of Io going into shadow and coming out of shadow was received here on Earth. And impressively, it's the same ballpark as the modern measurement that we know. It's completely comparable with uh, the modern values. So let me remind you what that modern value is. If miles per hour are your favoured unit, as I indicated earlier, it's 670 odd million miles per hour. We find it often much more convenient to think in terms of kilometers per second. Those units reflect rather more naturally um, the context that we're often dealing with. In units of kilometers per second, the speed of light is about 300,000 kilometers per second. At this moment, I'd like to introduce you to some jargon in the field. Instead of saying the speed of light, or instead of saying 300,000 kilometers per second, lots of syllables, we know this quantity, this important quantity, so key to a lot of our astrophysics. This quantity, the nomenclature here, is C. The speed of light is referred to in the field as C. For those who are very units agile, 
let me introduce you to another way of expressing the speed at which light moves. Light moves at 300 centimetres per nanosecond. A nanosecond is one billionth of a second. And for those who prefer imperial units, that's one foot per nanosecond. And so actually, that distance, 30 centimetres or a foot, the length of a bendy plastic ruler, that distance is sometimes referred to as... Um, uh, uh, sorry, it, it follows from this um, that the distance travelled by light in one second is 300,000 kilometres. And this distance is sometimes referred to as a light second. Now, you may be thinking that 300,000 kilometres is a very large distance. But I would suggest respectfully to you that that's a very earthly bound perspective. From the perspective of the cosmos, 300,000 kilometres is actually rather a short distance, as we'll see. But before I go on and explain why it might reasonably be considered a short distance, I just want to say that if even a foot, even 30 centimetres, is something that's measurable with modern technology, and if you might be measuring something which depends on, for example, lengths of cables connecting detectors in apparatus, it really matters for something I'm going to tell you later on in this lecture that you understand your cable lengths and your cable connectivities rather well. More of that in a few moments. So I contend that a light second, 300,000 kilometres, is a very short distance. And so now I want to introduce you to a light year, which I consider a much more useful unit in considering the cosmos. It is, of course, the distance travelled by light in one year. If you prefer kilometres, it's nine million million kilometres. Way fewer syllables to say one light year. <clears throat> one light year is a very handy unit of distance when we're dealing with the cosmos. So I've touched on the fact that Euler Romer measured the speed of light. He made observations. He thought about the geometry with which Earth was orbiting around the Sun and the moon of Io was orbiting around Jupiter. He made a timing experiment. It was an observation. But the other way in which we learn about the cosmos is by prediction and by theory and by conjecture which when confronted with data is either con enables us either to confirm or refute our theories. And so now I want to tell you about a prediction about the speed of light that was made some two centuries after Reumer measured, made the first measurements of the speed of light. James Clark Maxwell, the Scottish physicist, entirely independently of observation, made a prediction of what the speed of light ought to be. He made the remarkable prediction that the speed of light had a very pure dependence on only two physical quantities. And those two quantities are the following. One of these quantities is the rate at which electric fields propagate through space, and the second of these quantities is the rate at which magnetic fields propagate through space, through empty space. Just those two quantities. James Clark Maxwell predicted were what the speed of light depends on. His prediction is remarkable for a second reason. And that second reason is he got the right answer. His prediction that the speed of light should depend only on something to do with electric fields and something to do with magnetic fields, gave an answer bang in line with even more refined measurements of the speed of light than Reumer gave, us two century, gave him two centuries earlier. 
it's important to emphasize that saying that the speed of light has some absolute value, depending on electric field propagation, depending on magnetic field propagation, is something somewhat at odds with everyday experience, that when you measure the speed of something, it either depends on how fast you are moving with respect to it, or how fast, whatever the source of the signal is, the source of, of flashing light or something, is moving with respect to you. So that's a third remarkable thing about James Clerk Maxwell's predictions. And when I say his prediction was at odds with everyday experience, by at odds with, I mean caused serious consternation. It was understood at the time that you measure the speed of something in a way that depends on your speed or the speed of your detector. But if James Clerk Maxwell is saying, no, 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 it depends on the rate at which electric fields can propagate and the rate at which magnetic fields can propagate, that is something of a challenge for everyday intuition. But it, it had the merit of being correct. It had the merit of being subsequently verified by every experiment that could be thrown of, at it. It's entirely valid to think of light as propagating, as the propagation of a wave of varying electric fields depicted here in red and varying magnetic fields depicted here in yellow with the direction of travel being um, across the screen towards the right hand side. <clears throat> and so while James Clerk Maxwell's prediction fitted with this description of light, it was nonetheless very problematic because if you think the speed of light depends on the speed of what is emitting the light, or, as I have said, on the speed of you and your detector, whatever is detecting the light, you've got a big problem. At this point, the German scientist, Albert Einstein, enters our story. Here's a picture of Albert Einstein on something of a bad hair day, but Einstein is someone who thought very, very deeply about light and about space and about time and about what we now think of as space-time, the fusing together of those four dimensions. Albert Einstein made a postulate. A postulate is even more bold than a prediction. A postulate is saying, this is foundational. This is the way the universe appears to be. And Einstein's postulate was that the speed of light will always be measured to be exactly the same value, assuming we're in free space and we're not trying to um, uh, propagate through some uh, different medium or other. But Einstein postulated that the speed of light was always, always, always the same and could never be exceeded even if you had someone with a detector moving extremely, extremely fast trying to catch up that beam of light. This postulate is absolutely foundational in Einstein's special theory of relativity, also known as special relativity. Again, I would mention that at the time Einstein postulated this, he didn't have complete empirical justification. It was a bold conjecture that turned out to be absolutely correct, but it's important to point out at the time it was a very bold conjecture that was totally irreconcilable with our classical intuition about space and time. But part of Einstein's genius was to be able to dispense with the things that were part of our intuition, but not actually correct in certain physical regimes, such as when things are moving very, very fast, specifically at speeds comparable with the speed of light. 
And so Einstein said, even if I could travel really fast in pursuit of a photon, a photon is the word that physicists sometimes use for um, a ray of light, even if I could travel really fast after a ray of light, its velocity will still be c, the usual value of the speed of light, relative to me. This changes the way we think about the universe. That there is a maximum speed at which anything in the universe can travel, and the speed of light, by the way, is that maximum speed, has many important consequences. It has important consequences for causality, and it has very important consequences for the way that matter behaves in the vicinity of black holes. But that's something I'm going to address in my third lecture. Before I proceed, I want to address something that some in the audience may have heard about approximately eight years ago concerning the claim that a particular type of very small uh, particle had been observed to move faster than the speed of light. In September 2011, it was claimed that this very type, very special type of small particle that physicists refer to as a neutrino had been observed to travel faster than light. When this was claimed, it was a really big deal. It was on the front pages of the international media, the New York Times, uh, Le Monde, uh, the Times of London, Guardian, all the rest of it. Had this result have been true, it would have utterly turned upside down our understanding of physics. But of course, what you don't do when your scientific, your scientific endeavor presents you with a result you can't comprehend in the light of your existing understanding, you don't hide under a rock, you investigate it, you poke at it, you chew at it as a dog chews on a bone, and you try and figure out, is it right, is it wrong? Can I pull this result apart? Can I unravel it? Can I see where the flaw is in the measurement? It's very important in the scientific endeavor to have an honest and an open mind. In the endeavor of scientific research, the correct answers are not in the back of the book. But it's worse than that. The questions aren't even in the front of the book. So the business of scientific research involves trying to identify the key questions to ask and then figuring out if you've asked them, answered them correctly, honestly, carefully, and truthfully. Being absolutely intellectually open to whatever the data appear to be saying is key to wrestling with what the data mean and whether your interpretation is true or not. I frequently look to the economist John Maynard Keynes for important uh, guidance on this. And I'm profoundly struck by what he said in different ways at different times. In the light of new information, I change my mind. And so, as I said, the, uh, there was consternation, not only all over the physics world, but all over the media, when this result was uh, first announced um, about eight years ago. This is from the New York Times. The physics world is a buzz, not a bit of it. It was in uproar. If it's true, it is a result that would change the world, but that if is enormous. This is very accurate journalism. Here's a commentary by my colleague at the University of Oxford, <clears throat> Subir Sarkar. He said, I've highlighted it in pink. The constancy of the speed of light as being a maximum speed in, uh, in our universe essentially underpins our understanding of space and time and causality, which is the fact that cause comes before effect. He goes on later, cause cannot come after effect, and that is absolutely fundamental to the construction of the physical universe. 
If we do not have causality, we've got big problems. This was a big deal, but that's what the data implied, that these neutrinos were travelling a little bit faster, measurably faster, seemingly, than the speed of light. Well, let me tell you a little bit about how results get um, presented to the scientific community. The way it works is we write papers, we present papers, and all scientists who've made an intellectual contribution to a particular experiment or a particular observation, they sign up. <clears throat> a paper then consists of a summary, we call it an abstract. And it's fascinating to me that in this paper, where they were claiming that that top pink paragraph refers to exactly how much faster than the speed of light these neutrinos were reported to be travelling at, the scientists who wrote this paper were sufficiently shocked by their findings that the final sentence of their summary paragraph was, we're so, effectively, we are so sceptical about this, we deliberately do not attempt any theoretical or phenomenological interpretation of the results. A long, long paper then followed. I'm not going to reproduce it here, but that was the summary. This is what we found. We're really sceptical. We've got to get to work on wrestling with it. It took a few months to get to the bottom of this. In the meantime, a good many papers were published with people saying, well, if it's true, if it's true that these neutrinos can travel faster than what we thought was the maximum speed of light, could the explanation be made in terms of quantum mechanics? I'm always amused by this abstract. The answer was, <laughs> probably not. I'd like to underscore that following the abstract of every scientific paper, there is a long and discursive and analytical description of the justification for what's in the abstract. No exception here. Well, let me tell you about what this um, experiment was. Um, so, uh, just to orient us, we're here um, in uh, southeast England, and where the experiment took place is shown by uh, point A. Um, point A is where um, the neutrinos were detected at a place called Gran Sasso in Italy, where the neutrinos were uh, detected that were launched at CERN um, underneath Geneva um, in Switzerland. So the situation is that these neutrinos were um, launched at CERN and detected in Switzerland and detected in Gran Sasso in Italy. So you might ordinarily think of this as being quite some distance, but you know it's nothing compared with the Earth-Jupiter distance. But it's, it's not insignificant either. So the measurement was that when these neutrinos left CERN and then were subsequently detected in Gran Sasso, they made the journey 60 nanoseconds faster than if they had been travelling at the speed of light. I told you earlier that 30 centimetres or one foot is one light nanosecond. And so a journey time implied by 60 nanoseconds, if you're traveling at the speed of light, is about 60 feet. Remember what I said earlier about cables? Turns out, if you don't correctly characterize the travel time along your cables and how they're connected together, errors like this can creep in. And so it was. It was a faulty or a misunderstood cabling situation in the detector. Einstein was right after all, and there are a good many papers that, that describe how this result was investigated and then debunked. But I'd like to just draw your attention to the fact that the scientific endeavour is international and it is self-correcting. It is very important that data and findings and information are presented clearly and honestly to enable other scientists all across the world, also honest seekers after the truth, but with different perspectives to bring to these difficult uh, problems in the universe that we're trying to understand, in order to then make progress. 
the scientific endeavour is self-correcting. The time for this to self-correct was about five or six months. <clears throat> but now I want to tell you about something that is referred to in astrophysics as superluminal motion. You may be a little bit puzzled about this after what I've just said about you can't travel faster than the speed of light and even a recent or at least eight-year-old claim that you could travel faster than the speed of light was subsequently debunked. Super, of course, means over, luminal means light. And so superluminal, you might reasonably think, might refer to something travelling faster than the speed of light. Stay with me and I'll show you what that means. When I referred to light at the start of my talk, light is the everyday word that we use for something that physicists refer to as electromagnetic radiation. Radiation that can be characterized as wavelikeness in electric fields and in magnetic fields. The kind of light that our human eyes are sensitive to if we are blessed with good eyesight, is a very small portion of the overall spectrum of electromagnetic radiation. There is much more that is carried by electromagnetic radiation than can be seen with human eyes. You've almost certainly heard about radio waves, or at least made use of them, as you listen to the radio. Radio waves are just the same as optical waves, except radio waves are decently longer than optical waves. The wavelengths of optical light are something like 500 nanometers, or half a millionth of a meter, if you prefer that unit. Radio waves, think five centimeters, think 10 centimeters, think 90 centimeters. Long wavelengths are also a form of light that travel from distant objects in the universe, such as quasars. Similarly, at the more energetic end of the spectrum, shorter wavelength light is what uh, we term X-rays or gamma rays, depending on exactly how short wavelength or how energetic that type of light is. So now I'm going to show you a few images of exactly the same bit of sky, first at optical wavelengths, and you might think that what we're looking at here is just a bunch of stars, which is all very interesting. Stars are sites of nuclear fusion in the universe, so that is indeed interesting. But if we zoom in closely to the fuzzy little blob at the centre of this optical image, we see what is actually a galaxy a big galaxy containing lots and lots of stars. If we now look at this exact same region of sky, but at radio wavelengths, we see what I'm sure you will agree is a very different picture. This picture is on exactly the same angular scale as the picture I showed in my previous slide. I don't want to get into a later lecture just now, but I will mention that the length of one end of this radio galaxy or quasar is in excess of 100,000 light years. So this is the kind of object that you can see all across the sky if you can detect radio wavelengths. There's a great big black hole in the middle there, more of that in a subsequent lecture. I'm now going to take this black and white radio emitting plasma and colour it blue and embed it in red plasma. That red emission there is actually X-ray emission. Very short wavelength, very, very energetic light coming from the exact same region in space and telling us about the very, very hot gas that is surrounding the... Um, the quasar jets as they burst through. What I'm going to show you is something of the speeds at which those jets launch that then inflate these big radio bubbles from the very center point in these images. So from very, very near the central black hole. 
Turns out if you use radio observations and very special techniques within radio observations, this is a relatively straightforward um, measurement to make of speed. So let me show you the particular radio telescope um, that's relevant here. This is a telescope that comprises 10 radio antennas all across the globe, across the uh, transcontinental United States. And collectively, they give images that are very, very sharp in detail. In the parlance in the field, we say they have very fine angular resolution because you can resolve details that are very, very close to one another. Just how good is this resolution? Well, in fact, um, if I was standing in New York and you were standing in San Francisco and you had the same ability to resolve detail as this radio telescope has spread across the globe, you would be able to separate out either side of my little fingernail. I hope you're impressed. So if you now take images of one of these uh, jet launch points and you take successive images, you can see where different points have moved to at different times. Remember we did speed as defined by distance over time earlier in the lecture. You can see these, um, see these green and uh, pink um, uh, plasmons, radio emitting plasmons moving. As you look at successive um, intervals, um, these, these were taken um, once, every, once every month in uh, the early part of um, 2000 and 2001, you can see these points successively move through space. If you know how far away it is, you know what that angular size corresponds to, so you know the distances involved, and the times were in the top right corner, and so you can make a measurement of the speeds implied. My friends, those speeds are a few times the speed of light. Where does that leave us? What are we to do? Well, this is why it's really important to understand the subtleties and the realities of a given situation. If you consider the geometry in all of this, and you first consider that one of those blobs is down in the bottom left at point A, let's say it travels at five sixths of the speed of light for six years, and then when it's traveled five light years, it emits another um, uh, signal of light. And so if we then uh, think about what happens uh, to that light, let's suppose that the light that was emitted when uh, the first object was at, when the object uh, was at point A, let's suppose that's received on Earth in 2017. Actually, because by the time it's moved uh, four light years in the direction parallel to the bottom of the screen, when the light leaves it, it's starting from a point that is four light years closer to Earth. So the light from the second location is received a mere two years after it was emitted. And so by misconstruing the distances that we're talking about, it's possible to wrongly attribute the observed motion to motion that's faster than the speed of light. By applying a, an understanding of the geometry to the situation and accounting for the fact that what's being launched here are blobs of plasma moving at speeds comparable with the speed of light. Five sixths of C is agreed to be comparable with the speed of light. Then you can get these very, very, very uh, wacky, seemingly apparently superluminal super speeds. Let me close with one final example. This is a particular radio galaxy in the fairly nearby universe, sometimes called Messier 87, sometimes called Virgo A. The extent of that radio emitting um, halo, which was um, observed at a wavelength of about 90 centimeters, is getting on for half a million light years in extent. This was work done by Fraser Owen and co-workers at the United States National Radio Astronomy Observatory. If I zoom in on that orange bit there with uh, finer and finer angular resolution, then 
gradually we get closer and closer to the uh, launch point. And I'm now going to show a movie where there's a blob on the top side that's moving apparently at four times the speed of light, whereas other blobs are moving nearer to uh, twice uh, the speed of light. So this movie is on a bit of a loop, but you get the idea, I hope, that every single individual image is a still in this movie. And as we see these blobs move apart to different distances, and as we've time-stamped the images very, very carefully, it's natural to measure these seemingly superluminal speeds. But by factoring in the geometry and an understanding of exactly how fast the emitting radio plasma is moving, we can correctly calculate that this plasma is not in fact moving faster than the speed of light, but it is a comfortable 80 or 90 percent of the speed of light. Still very fast, I hope you'll agree with me, but I would like to summarize this lecture by answering the question posed in the title of this talk, faster than light? No. Thank you very much.